Hey everyone, it's Lisa Z from RCP. Today we have a special bonus episode for you where we interview the author Michael Cannell about his new book called Incendiary, which is about the mad bomber who terrorized New York in the 1950s and about the psychiatrist who helped police catch him by creating the first ever criminal profile. So I have to tell you that a funny thing happened on the way to recording this episode. The entire building housing our recording studio had a power outage and we were completely stuck. This was the one day when everybody was available and we only had this brief little window of time to record Laura in London, Michael in New York, and Jim and I in LA. So we had to scramble and we ran to a friend's house. Jim and I jammed into his guest bedroom, set up our Skype, and had to make do with our laptops to record. So we apologize that the sound quality isn't perfect, but we did the best we could with what we had. We really wanted to talk to Michael about his book, not only about the invention of profiling, but how to compare the Mad Bomber to the Unabomber. And we also talk about a very controversial article written by Malcolm Gladwell that attempted to debunk profiling as a junk science. And you will definitely want to hear what Jim has to say about that. So all that is up next on Real Crime Profile. A 15-year reign of terror ended in New York when George Metesky was captured and admitted bombing 21 public places with a deranged motif, revenge. Also ended was the spy career of Colonel Abel, arrested after nine years as master Russian agent. Operating a stone's throw from the federal building, he met his fate there in the form of a long prison term. Desperation drove the police to pursue a course they had never before considered in the department's 111-year history. On that late fall afternoon, Captain Finney and his two bomb squad sidekicks left headquarters to call on Dr. James A. Brussel, a psychiatrist with expertise in the workings of the criminal mind. If physical evidence could not lead the police to FP, maybe emotional insights could. Catching criminals was police work. What could a psychiatrist know about it? Hello, and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is your host, Jim Clementi, former New York City prosecutor and retired FBI profiler with my co-host... Laura Richards, criminal behavioral analyst and former New Scotland Yard, advocate, author, and founder and director of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. And I'm Lisa Zambetti. I'm the casting director for Criminal Minds, where Jim Clementi is my colleague. Well, we have a very special guest today with us. Michael Cannell. I'm the author of, I'm a former New York Times editor, and I'm the author of uh, a new book called Incendiary, The uh, Psychiatrist, the Mad Bomber, and the Invention of Criminal Profiling. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for coming on Real Crime Profile. We've been waiting for this for a long time. I'm glad we finally got our schedules together. But we really want to hear about this book. I know um, I have had a little bit of a hand in uh, helping you along with this book, and I was very excited when I heard that you were going to write it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. You were you were nice enough to um, speak to me when I was doing the research and reporting for this book. You were uh, generous enough to speak to me when you had no idea who I was or what I was doing, and, and now here we are talking about the finished book. Well, that's great. So can you tell us, just to start off with, what drew you to this topic? Why did you write this book, Incendiary, about the man, Mad Bomber of New York? Yeah, I've, I've written three nonfiction books, and I'm completely unqualified, in a sense, to have written, have written any of them. Um, I don't have any, any specialty in, in these subject areas. I certainly don't have any background in criminology or profiling, but I have a background as a reporter and a journalist. And um, my previous book was um, a true story, nonfiction, about um, two men on the Ferrari race team in the 50s. And I was researching that book in the New York Public Library, reading microfilm, when I saw a headline really? uh, about the Mad Bomber of New York. And it just, it just jumped out at me. And I don't normally say things like this, but I had a kind of funny hunch that that was going to be that was going to be my, my next project. Wow. And I began to read about this story about the serial bomber in New York in the 1950s and about the way in which uh, a newspaper publisher corresponded with the bomber during the manhunt and about the psychiatrist, most importantly about the psychiatrist who helped the police um, catch the catch the serial bomber at a time when 
the police were not inclined to talk to psychiatrists. That's a whole lot of stuff right there. So let's we're going to have to go back and break it down. Yeah, but, first of all, what's microfilm? Just kidding. I know a lot of people <laughs> I mean, won't even know what that is. <laughs> I know it very well because I remember the in the early days, well, when I was going to college and law school, um, that was the only way. It was sort of the Internet for, I don't know, the the... Yes, it was what, century. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. it was the way you read newspapers before the internet, and it's it's if you people assume that all newspapers are and books are digitized, but they really aren't. So if you if you want to do deep background and deep research on a book that on a subject that took place in the nineteen forties or fifties, you really have to go find those old newspapers on on microfilm. It's really laborious, but it's in a strange way kind of fun too. Yeah. So But had you actually heard about this case before that? Or was that the first time no, when you saw Absolutely not. And absolutely not. I mean this serial bomber was caught sixty years ago. And so I think the story um resides in this interesting spot where it's it's within the memory, not our memory, but maybe the memory of our parents or grandparents, but is quickly slipping into history. So it occupies this funny liminal spot between live memory and, and history. Wow. So That's an interesting point. And I think certainly for, you know, it's a certain generation, but as Jim and I know, it's also, you know, marked the advent and invention of criminal profiling. So it is... Um, a case that's handed down amongst profilers in terms of training. So it's great to hear about your research and how you went about it and how long it took as well. Well, those of you who worked in this 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 field, of course, would know know this case. Uh, yeah, I suspect very very well. But to the rest of us, we really people are absolutely amazed to to find that that profiling didn't always exist. Well, what's funny is that even after this case and in all the decades since this case, there's still some people we've noticed recently oh, yeah. who believe that profiling has never, in fact, solved a single case. And so let's, why don't we talk a little bit about this? The fact that sure. this investigation, how long was this guy bombing? How many bombs did he do? And why was it that the police did eventually rely on him to actually get the biggest break in this case? Yeah, he set off his, he planted his first bomb in 1940, if you can believe it. He was caught in 1957. So he spanned a pretty good stretch of mid-century, 20th century. It's a little deceptive to say that because he planted a couple of bombs before World War II. And then he wrote a letter to a newspaper in New York saying, I'm going to go on hiatus during the war. Because even, even though he was planting bombs and he was a kind of domestic terrorist, he was still very patriotic and he didn't want to interfere with the war effort. Well, and so then he resumed, he resumed in 1950 and really gained steam in the, in the mid to late 50s. And he set off, uh, he planted 32 bombs in all. And in the, in the, um, in the midst of his real thick campaign, leave you know, 55, 56, uh, he, was, um, he was causing New Yorkers to um, avoid public places. People were scared enough that they didn't go into department stores or they were reluctant to go into movie theaters. And he really, he really created, even though the bombs themselves had about the explosive power of a hand grenade. They were not enormous bombs. They were dangerous bombs. And he set them off with a, um, he set them off in such a way that they, they created a disproportionate anxiety. Terrorism. In That's exactly what he wanted to do. So he was a perfect example of domestic terrorism. He was. He really, he was, it was not, the, he was not the first person to set off a bomb in New York. But he was arguably the first to adopt this kind of strategy about random explosions in public places, which created a, a very particular kind of, of terror um, that would, you know, New Yorkers today, when they think of terror, of course, they think of 9-11. But, but people have forgotten that this, 
that this that this kind of anxiety existed in the 1950s. I, d- I lived in New York for 15 years. I never heard of this case, and my grandparents, you know, were from New York and lived there, you know, all their lives, and it have told me stories about New York, and this, they've never mentioned this well, at all. Well, it's one of the reasons why the NYPD uh, claims to have uh, the, the best counterterrorism experience in the world because of they started looking at these kinds of cases even before the 1940s and certainly very consistently since then and obviously through 9-11. So that's why they have such a the ability to claim uh, that expertise. But when you say he was he was bombing from 40 to 57, that's that's about the same length of time that Ted Kaczynski was bombing um, the Unabomber. And but even even Ted during that time period to like Metesky was has taken taken a t- some time off. So there were a number of years where Ted Kaczynski did not bomb, not because he was patriotic, but because he almost got caught. So it's kind of interesting that they have that unique similarity between these two very famous serial bombers. Well, Jim, you you would know this. I I, I have an inkling of this, but you would probably know this better than I would. I, I believe that Ted Kaczynski was acutely aware of the the mad bomber of the 1950s um, history and may to some extent have patterned himself after yes. after after George Metesky. Yeah, George and Ted had different um, ultimate goals with their bombing, but I think that they had their personal cause bombers and I think they Metesky helped us profile actually profile the Unabomber case as well. So uh, but let's talk a little bit more about um, Metesky and what happened um, with respect to law enforcement. How did they you know, deal with this for a number of well, very troubling years? Well, this was the time when the crime lab in, in New York and, and the bomb squad was, was just coming into... Um, it's its own. I mean, it was uh, in 1940, there had been an a, uh, explosion at the World's Fair in New York that had killed two detectives. And after that, the um, bomb squad in New York adopted um, the, uh, the procedures that I guess you could call the kind of modern procedures that, that followed them through through this period. And so... Um, when um, George Metesky was engaged in this bombing campaign in New York, the bomb squad would, of course, race to the so- to the scene of these these bombs. If the bombs did not go off, they they removed the bombs to a military facility in Queens and exploded them there. Uh, the police wanted t- to keep. This, the details of these bombings very quiet. That would have been the natural police procedure at that time. As the years went by, the uh, then police commissioner, uh, Stephen Kennedy, at a certain point, decided that he would reverse course and that he would publicize um, these bombings as much as possible and publicize the work that the psychiatrist James Brussel had done with the with the police, and at that point there were an enormous number of um, fake bombings of of hoaxes, and I I believe that at on the on the bomb squad's busiest day, they um, visited 50, um, 50 sites. So the bomb squad was going twenty four hours a day, traversing the city at a at a crazy um, mad pace. So. It was a an embarrassment to not just the police, but also to the mayor of New York, who was then Robert Wagner, that they were unable to catch the bomber for this long period of time. Yeah. And an embarrassment particularly because this was a time when crime was spiking. It was the opposite of today when the, when the headlines are all about how low crime is. In the 1950s, crime was was out of control in, in New York and many other cities. And so the bomber, the, 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 the um, failure to catch the bomber sort of symbolized the way in which the city was becoming, becoming lawless. He became the most wanted criminal at that time, didn't he? 
Well, you know, I'm not, I don't know that he was ever declared that. I never ran across any information um, on, on that, but I would have to believe, I would have to believe that that was the case. Makes yeah. sense. But there was media saying he was like Jack the Ripper and comparing it to New Scotland Yard. And obviously Jack the Ripper was never caught. That was our most notorious serial killer case. And of course, the inference there is that, well, what if he would never be caught. So I would imagine that the pressure brought to bear upon the police department, and given that they had a media blackout, you know, that they had to decide to use a different tactic. And I think it was a very brave move. Um, you know, maybe one that should have been uh, an earlier tactic was to try and use the media. And of course, that's something that profilers um, also give advice on, don't we, Jim, of how to use the media. And that was something that Dr. Brussels also um, said that this individual, in terms of his type, typology and his personality, it would probably be really difficult for him being invisible and in the shadows, not being able to claim his work, because that's what he's trying to achieve, is, is attention. And of course, he remains invisible and unknown and unnamed. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that you mentioned that, because that's a very important point. The police didn't come up with the idea of publicizing the... Um, the manhunt on their own. It was the psychiatrist, Dr. Brussel's um, idea, and he urged this on the police for exactly the reasons that you, that you articulated. He um, strongly suspected that the, that the bomber wanted to be known, that he wanted his, what he believed to be his great moral campaign and his kind of superiority and genius. He wanted all of that to be to be to be made known, and so um, part of what's important about this story is that the publisher of an afternoon newspaper, the New York Journal American, participated in this part of the story by writing letters to the bomber on the front page of the newspaper, and lo and behold, the bomber would write back to the newsroom, and so this kind of semi-secret correspondence began with the bomber. And uh, this was part of what Dr. Brussel was talking about, of course, that the bomber wouldn't be able to resist um, getting back to the authorities about his, you know, and to correct the record. Hello, it's Jim Clementi and Francie Hakes with a special message about a new show that I'm hosting on Wondery called Locked Up Abroad. In each episode, people tell their harrowing stories of being convicted of crimes and jailed in foreign lands, or kidnapped and held hostage in war-torn countries. These are definitely worst-case, worst-case scenarios. They're truly frightening situations. Yes, no best cases here. But it is fascinating to hear how they manage to survive these ordeals. In the first episode, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes tells us about being imprisoned in Turkey for smuggling hashish. Oliver Stone even made a movie about it. But that was the movie. This is the real story. I haven't had the chance to interview Billy Hayes recently, and he told me the whole story behind the story of how he escaped a Turkish prison. He even told me that he went back to Turkey years later. You have to hear his story to believe it. And now, in his own words, here is Billy Hayes. To street-hardened detectives, a psychiatrist carried no more weight than a psychic or a fortune teller. Dr. Brussel knew that by venturing a psychiatric assessment of the bomber, what we now call a profile, he would be putting his profession's credibility on the line. And his own. Well, I think that there's a number of breakthrough things that happened in this case. And one of the things you mentioned earlier was about the, the number of hoaxes that were occurring at that time. This is one of the reasons why we have advised, right, Laura, that we don't give too much attention to the name of the offenders so that they are not, they are not competing to be the next biggest offender, the next biggest offender, and so on and so forth. So we try to minimize that if we can. We suggest that the press does not use their name, but in certain cases, there are things that you can do through the press to mollify an offender, to get them to sort of sit back and relax and not be as aggressive. So sometimes we will do that. 
Yeah, I mean, what seems really unusual about this this um, story in regard to the press is that Seymour Berkson, the publisher of the journal American, cooperated with the police and vice versa. So I'm a newspaper guy. In my experience, the newspapers don't normally cooperate with the, with the police or municipal authorities. But in this case, they they had to. They coordinated with each other, and they were kind of allies in this in this uh in this manhunt so they were sort of two prongs of the of the team that that caught the mad bomber the third prong of course being james russell the psychiatrist but the when you mentioned the manhunt and cooperation with the police that's exactly how the unabomber was caught as well um it was the fact that jim fitzgerald actually pushed the team to publish the manifesto that got his sister-in-law and then his brother to come forward Mm -hmm. at the same time as the investigation that Jim Fitzgerald was during the investigation, uh, looking at the forensic similarities between Kaczynski's doctoral thesis and uh, the manifesto. And he was able to actually get the uh, search warrant for his, his cabin in the woods. And that is what led to his arrest. Laura? Well, I was just going to say, you know, any correspondence and, you know, what was interesting was, as you said, there was an alliance. They they all had a shared interest, a shared agenda of bringing him in. And I'm sure that ego played out afterwards of who was it that really was the successful part of this sort of odd marriage of of convenience. But I think, you know, as Jim well knows, you know, you, you want to prevent any hoaxes, any other... Um, bombers as well from starting out up and of course you want to ensure that you hold back key information because you want to ensure that when you find the real bomber the the person who really is doing it that there are key things that only they know that means that you can corroborate through evidence and through knowledge that this is actually the person Um, and I know through, through your writing you talked about that you know in detail that certain things were held back because they wanted to make sure that when they did catch him, that they would be able to question him and there would be things that only he would know about. Yeah, he was, uh, he was extraordinarily cooperative um, when they caught him. Um, so just sort of a little bit of background without giving away too much of the story. When the police went to James Brussel, they showed him all the evidence. And... Um, they showed him the the uh, exploded pipe bombs and these very strange bits of correspondence that the bomber had with the with the, the newspaper. And um, James Brussel famously now um, said, "The man you're looking for is uh, from a Slavic background. He lives in the northern suburb of New York City. Um, he has is not married. He's probably never had a girlfriend." Um, he has a history of workplace disputes. He lives with an older female relative. And, and the real sort of killer line is that James Brussel said, when you catch him, he'll be wearing a double-breasted jacket. And so the, about a month later, the police went to a house in Waterbury, Connecticut at midnight and knocked on the door. And, and um, a middle-aged man came and answered the door. And it was George Metesky, the serial bomber. And he... He fit that description, I, I'm not going to say exactly, but but almost exactly. And at that point, he was, when he was interrogated, he was extraordinarily cooperative. Just to, to your point, Laura, he was um, eager to unburden himself of his story and his grievances and had an incredible recall for the mechanics and the logistics of, of this bombing campaign, you know, that had gone gone back, you know, 16 years. I was just going to say the way that it was described, um, you know, that he was enjoying every moment of it and almost, you know, really basking in the attention and, you know, reliving every moment of his, as he would see it, his superiority. And some of the pictures you've included, I think the book is, is fantastic um, it really is a page turner. I have to say, I know the story, but it is a page turner. And, you know, it's very oh, difficult to yeah. put down. And as I've been reading it in London, 
my team and various other people have seen me reading it, picked it up and been trying to nab it off of me oh. <laughs> because they just thought it sounded so brilliant. So I that's really nice. Got, that's, that's the ultimate compliment dibs on the right book. there. Yeah, yeah I well, I mean, for, for me, you know, it was a great read and it, just your attention to detail and just the some of the photos you include of just, you can see on his face, it, it's he is just absolutely not just smiling he is basking the attention and enjoying every moment of it and the photographers taking all these pictures of him um you know it's one of the biggest grins that you you do a double take and you're not sure if that's really him you know on arrest but of course he wanted to tell them all um how clever he had been that was all part of you know part and parcel of it and i really like that detail all those things that you put in as well as some of the pictures just showing how smug he looks and how pleased and, and relieved and I, I think he said something like you know that he was sorry that he harmed those people but he's not he wasn't sorry that he did it Is that yeah the, I mean, the, the just the the image that always came to my mind was the red carpet at the oscars when he was taken down to the old police headquarters in New York City for booking, um, the the car pulled up to this one block street called Center Market Place on the east side of the old police headquarters. And there was a, a crowd of press there, about five people deep. The flash bulbs were going off and he was parading around as if he was a, a star on the red carpet outside of the Oscars. He um, he absolutely basked in the glory of his moment, believing, uh, I guess, that that he that there was uh, in in his mind something um, grandiose and heroic about about the campaign that he had undertaken, and that this was his his kind of his um, his heroic moment in front That's of. Great, and I have to say. Michael, that I uh, definitely echo what Laura said about the book and how well written it is and how detailed it is. And of course, I know that the history of that issue, uh, as we discussed when you were writing the book, um, that, that you did want to really hold out, uh, you know, a flag of congratulations to Dr. Brussel because he did really kick off an amazing new way that law enforcement can be helped in solving very difficult crimes. Um, there's, a, there's a whole debate about whether or not uh, profiling is effective, and I think this case is, a, is an exemplary case in which the police had literally no clue at all as to who this bomber was, and he was an active bomber, and he was bombing uh, just so prolifically, and they really needed help. And this psychiatrist had the guts to push forward and to be persistent. And in the end, it caused this bomber to be arrested. Well, one of the things I've, I've learned about, about James Brussel, and I'd be very curious to know your, your reactions, is that, is that if, if we can talk about his genius, I don't want to overstate what he did, but if it's possible to talk about him that way, it wasn't just a psychiatric genius it's that it's that he was also a salesman it, it seemed to me that what he did in this episode was not just come up with the idea about profiling and performed it arguably for the first time but that he sold it he sold it to the police and later kind of sold it to the public and he sold it i suppose to the police in 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 the um, ensuing cases in which he was a consultant. So the important thing about him, I think, is not just that he was he was able to make this this leap, um, but that he was able to um, he was able to persuade others that his his um, his unconventional thinking was 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 had merit and that it was um that it was uh legitimate because at this time the police in new york were as i said earlier they were simply not inclined to solicit help from somebody like him right. police work meant uh doing what police had always done at that time which was roughing up suspects and leaning on informants and the police were extremely 
um, reluctant to accept that anybody with a college education or a white lab coat could, could help them. It just simply wasn't part of their MO. It's a familiar scenario seen almost every night on TV. A ghastly crime has been committed. A smartly dressed man or woman walks grim-faced into the crime scene, picks up an ostensibly irrelevant object, a snow globe or a fountain pen, maybe turning it around in his hands. The profiler says, our killer is a 35-year-old man with a limp. Cue the local cops who now know who to look for. TV shows like Criminal Minds and movies like The Silence of the Lambs not only celebrate the criminal profiler, they've established the profile as a legitimate, at times almost magical, tool for investigators. So just so our listeners know, Michael's book Incendiary is available on Audible, and listeners can get his audiobook for free with a 30-day trial membership by going to audible.com slash real crime. Again, that's audible.com slash real crime. So you can hear Michael Cannell read the prologue to the book on Audible. So go to audible.com slash real crime. It's an amazing book. So we were just talking a little bit about James Brussel and how not only did he come up with the thought of psychological profiling, uh, but he was able to convince the police and eventually the world about how this new science, this new art and science could actually help police solve incredibly difficult cases in a, in a very amazing way. So when you started researching this, Michael, what did you find out about James Brussel? Well, one of the first things that I did was to go speak to James Brussel's uh, stepdaughter and um, stepson. James, James Brussel passed away um, years ago, so, uh, but I did want to speak to the people close to him. And um, what I found out was, amazingly, that James Brussel appeared to be just about as crazy as the bomber was. <laughs> he was, he he was, was eccentric, he, wasn't he? He was really, I mean, eccentric would be a generous way of putting it. He was, um, he, he, well, it, we should say, first of all, that he was a psychiatrist employed by the state of New York. And his job was essentially to run the psychiatric hospitals in, in, in and around um, New York City. And this was not an easy job. There, were, um, there was enormous overcrowding, really grim conditions in those hospitals. And it was just before um, the, the great advent of um, psychiatric drugs. And so they were still relying on... Um, what we would now consider to be these kind of primitive procedures like frontal lobotomies, and they would put patients into um, induced comas and then bring them out of comas in the belief that that would at least temporarily cleanse them of their madness. And I mentioned this therapy too. I'm sorry. And electroshock therapy too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of those things. And so I mentioned this because Dr. Brussel would have had a real um, intimate um, familiarity with, um, I think, the, the human condition in its most extreme and grimmest conditions. He himself lived on the grounds of a, of a psychiatric hospital and he employed a patient as his housekeeper. He was really a nut. I mean, he wrote so many crossword puzzles that they had to be published in New York City newspapers in a variety of names so that it didn't, it wasn't awkward. And he wrote these crossword puzzles on sheets of white paper that he obsessively drew into grids with pencils that he obsessively sharpened and obsessively um, arranged on his, on his desk. He carried a gun with him everywhere. He was not sh shy about waving his gun in the air to get people's attention <laughs> he was when he was teaching because he taught a psychiatric course. Um, he was a very talented musician, and he was a kind of nutty showman. And after... Is that a technical he, term there, Michael? Y yes, I guess. <laughs> he diagnosed that's layman, him. <laughs> that's a layman's term. But he years later, he, after this episode was a over, he wrote a, um, a murder mystery. Um, and the murder mystery was about um, a man who murders his unfaithful wife 
And Dr. Brussel very tellingly said that he him, considered himself to have a kind of criminal mind and that he was able to write that book because he essentially thought as a criminal did. And he said this jokingly, but, but like many comments that people make jokingly, there was more than a kernel of truth in it. Yeah. I think that his part of his genius was that he understood that the, the serial bomber, um, it wasn't that he didn't have any logic, it's just that it wasn't a logic that the rest of us would have understood. And so um, uh, I think Dr. Dr. Brussel was um, just a little bit different enough and had seen enough of of the way in which life can 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 be um, run on unconventional tracks, shall we say, that, that he was able to make this um, make this shift into the bomber's way of thinking. Right, and well, look who he was hanging around with, you know, every day, who he was exposed to, and I think he called it reverse psychology, didn't he? That was his initial. So that's right. Was yeah, that, was, that was his term, and I understand that to mean that while a psychiatrist might see a patient and examine a patient and understand who that patient was and might speculate about what that patient's future behavior might be, he took reverse psychology to mean cases like profiling, where you don't know who, who the patient is or the subject is, you only know their behavior. So reverse psychology, you have the behavior but not the person right. instead of the person and not the behavior. Yeah, so what we say in the behavioral analysis unit at the FBI is that profiling is basically reverse engineering a crime. You look at crime scenes and criminal behavior and we reverse engineer back to the type of person who committed that crime. It's not like uh, what they call racial profiling, which is saying that people with certain characteristics will go ahead and commit a crime. But when a crime has been committed, we can look at that behavior, we can suss out very incredibly detailed behavioral information from that, and then tell the police or the FBI, whatever agency is investigating, what kind of person committed this crime, what they're like in the real world, what their relationships are, what their jobs are, what their pre and post defense behavior is. And all that information can help it weed out other potential suspects, and, and in many cases, it can actually focus on an individual and actually solve a crime that before that was absolutely unsolved. Well, when I have, have spoken in connection with this book a handful of times that I've made public appearances, and there's a, there's a question and answer period, the topic of the FBI always comes up, and the way in which James Russell influenced the FBI um, comes up, and what I often say is that it is speculation on my part, nobody ever said this to me, but that I suspected that J. Edgar Hoover wanted profiling under the S FBI's auspices to be thought of as a, as a science, and maybe a hard science, because he didn't want the FBI to be associated with anything as um, intuitive, yeah. as as uh, Doc, Dr. Brussel's form of, of profiling. Does that sound right to you? Well, I think so. And I think, obviously, it's evolved over the years. The first group of profilers, you know, Roger Teton and, and John Douglas and so forth, they eventually interviewed 38 different uh, serial offenders that were imprisoned. Uh, since then, when I retired, we had re interviewed over 1,500, and that was seven years ago. So they've interviewed many more than that. And so the higher the end, the higher the number of, of, of cases and of offenders that we interview, cases we study and offenders that we interview, the, the more it approaches a science. But here's the thing. We've always thought of it as a mix of art and science because just like medicine is a mix of art and science, some people think medicine is an absolute science, but when you... When you're unfortunate enough to have to go through medical issues, you find out that, that a lot of it is, is nuance. And, and you might call it guesswork, but for the experienced medical professional, it's not really guesswork. It's using intuition. It's using a part of their brain that they may not be able to understand and completely explain. 
but is using it in a way that there are certainly people who rise to the top of that profession who are able to suss out very, very obscure diagnoses and save people that other people can't. And I think in the same way, you have profilers who do the same thing. I'm sure Laura and I have worked cases over the course of our careers where we can't actually put our finger on why we were so adamant about a particular person being the offender. But in the end, it has worked out. It has been the case. And what it is, I believe, is our brains are educated so that our instincts, we have the trust in our instincts, our educated instincts, and we allow that to actually rise to the top or the forefront of our brain. We allow that to direct us when we direct an investigation based on behavior. And I don't know if you want to comment on that, Laura, but I found that the more confidence I had in the experience that I've taken in, the more accurate I was at profiling. I think, yes, yeah, certainly over the years it's evolved. I mean, everything at New Scotland Yard, we took very much from the behavioral science units at, uh, or the behavioral science unit, I should say, at, at the FBI. And certainly a lot of it does come down to that experiential learning when you've been exposed to lots of different cases. And that's obviously what Dr. Brussels was talking to, first of all, of just all the people he'd been exposed to. But secondly, it was much more about the, the mind space that he was about how people make decisions. Um, and a lot of it came down to probabilities. You know, he talked about it in terms of a game of odds. There's deductive, deductive and inductive reasoning, but there's also the probabilities and possibilities. And as I always say when I'm talking to people about cases, there are always lots of possibilities about who it is, what, what their typology is, what they're about, their day-to-day. -day. And there are always you know, infinite amount of possibilities. But what you're trying to get to is the probability, what's much more likely. And then, of course, you can start to now, the, um, the case analysis has evolved. Of course, you have statistics and you can compare it against lots of different cases. So that you know that, you know, most predatory snipers, for example, they're, they tend to be lone wolves. They tend to be a person on their own. There are certain things that we understand from looking at lots of different cases. But then, as Jim and I talk about, um, certainly in the last few podcasts, we've talked about the 1%, which is the percent that you've never seen before. And you always have to be very mindful of that. I, I certainly am. Every time I talk about cases... Um, tomorrow I'll be training social workers on risk assessment and on domestic violence and stalking and harassment and honor-based violence, abuse and predatory behavior. And I always talk about this is what we see in patterns, but you always have to be mindful of seeing something that's outside your experiential learning. And then you do have that intuitive sense, the thing like Jim's just described, um, which is, I, I still think, it is the sum of all your learning that you can't consciously process, but you know it. It's what sits behind everything. It's the thing that you know in the blink of an eye, but you can't always put your finger on exactly what that is. And that's why, you know, seasoned and experienced professionals, um, you know, always have a hand on the supervision of, you know, junior officers or junior staff, because you have that, that sense of experience. And the, the, there are times where things just make sense in the middle of the night at three o'clock in the morning. Suddenly, your unconscious mind that's been processing everything, it crunches away and suddenly it becomes really clear. Yeah. And, you know, that's not woo woo stuff. That is truly about the way that our mind is a mystery in many senses of how we crunch so much information and data on a day to day basis. And that's what neuroscientists are still trying to to get to grips with. So I think there's so many things going on and the more experience that you have and the more, you know, sometimes for me, the more cases I've worked, the more experience that I have, the more I realize there's still things that I don't know about. And I think it's also knowing about your infallibility, knowing about, you know, that there are weaknesses. You can never be 100% certain. And I think that's what you have to be very clear and upfront about that this is something that's a tool and that can be very helpful. And for law enforcement, it's really important that we offer that when we have a situation like this of narrowing the pool down so that they have a clear understanding of the types of individuals and the types of pools that they should be fishing in. And of course, this case really does exemplify every aspect um, of that down to, as, as you mentioned, when he went, when the police officers went to his house, I think he was wearing um, you know, a dressing gown, and he was very neatly 
and well put together but when they asked him to go and get dressed he reappeared wearing the double the very famous <laughs> double um double dressed suit jack. yeah it was buttoned up and of course the police couldn't believe their eyes because he had been so specific but i will say that there as you know uh, both of you know very well there were some things that he wasn't accurate about and i think it's important to attend to those things too so that we do learn you know it's not just about having that hindsight bias and seeing the things that you are accurate on it's also looking at and reviewing what are the things that weren't accurate and understanding those things too yes um first of all let me say both of you have articulated all of that so clearly so so thank thank you for that he, 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 Malcolm Gladwell, uh, the New Yorker writer, wrote a, a an article for the New Yorker magazine that I'm, I suspect you all you all know. Yes, he um, did. Some years ago, I can't remember what year it would have been. It would have been maybe t ten years ago, um, in, in which he um, it, it's it's sort of his his shtick is to debunk conventional thinking. And in this case, he was debunking profiling. Yeah, and, oh, I didn't um, that. it was in 2007. Like 2007, you had right 2007 there. in the New Yorker. Yeah, there yeah. we go, Michael. Uh, he he cited he cited the Metesky case, the the case that we're talking about, and he did mention the things that Dr. Russell um, got wrong. One of which is that Dr. Russell had speculated that the bomber had an illness, and I believe. Um, I believe that Dr. Russell had said it was cancer, and in fact, it was not cancer; it was tuberculosis. Okay, so uh, yeah, can no, we just start like, there? What? Yeah. So that's the that's, you know um, that you know. Of course, I read that article, and we all did in the profiling unit, and we all you know would have just laughed it off. But you know, unfortunately, popular media things like that sometimes can damage uh, the actual positive effect of of profiling. But um, the point that he makes that, well, he got the wrong illness um, is just, it's completely absurd. The point is that it was an illness. The point is that yeah. how the behavior was. And the ultimate point is that his profile did in fact point to this particular offender. And that's why he was arrested. He would not have been a suspect ever under the traditional police investigative tools. So well, it, it it seems to me if you can if you can say what the offender is going is wearing when when he's arrested, you're you're doing pretty well. Yeah, you're doing pretty so. well if you point in you know what his motive is, you know what he's going to be doing, why he's going to be doing it, and what he's wearing. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. But the other thing that the article did was, for example, took a quote by John Douglas uh, completely out of context. The article basically when when Douglas sort of quipped that. You know, some things seem magical about it. You know, we just can't explain it. I think what Douglas was trying to do was break it down to the average person. Douglas was a fascinating uh, profiler. He he's a fascinating personality, and but he also you know is a person, and he wasn't trying to sum up all of profiling by that one statement. And it's outrageous that that Gladwell was using it in that way, saying that it's really just fantasy. When in fact, what Douglas was talking about is what Laura said so articulately before, and what we've said for many decades, that the subconscious mind crunches data in trillions of a second, our conscious mind in hundreds of a second. So subconscious is 10 billion times faster. And because of that, we can calculate things in our subconscious that our conscious isn't even aware of, yet they communicate with each other. And it communicates with experienced professionals through that, that instinctual learning, that, that learning that we get by rep repetition of thousands and thousands of cases over the course of our careers. And it does inform our instinct, and it does help us solve these cases. So, yes, I, I was, when I was asking earlier about why you came upon this uh, topic, I thought maybe it was because of Gladwell's article or or at least that it had something to do with it. And I will tell you this, I'm so happy that you wrote this book because it is such a more balanced and actually insightful look at how profiling came to be and what its actual benefits are. So I thank you for that. Thank you, I appreciate that. I mean, the one thing that I just wanted to add to this part of our discussion is that I do get the sense that Dr. Brussel, Dr. Brussel's thinking was absolutely in line with everything that the two of you have described 
but I, I get the sense that he had a very particular interest in the in the in almost the mystical aspects of the of intuition. He really absorbed the evidence and closed his eyes and tried to conjure the offender. He was not he did not shy away from that part of this part of this process. Not that it in any way contradicts what you said before, but I think Dr. Russell kind of celebrated that part of it in right. a way. He but, he was particularly interested in this in this uh, way in which he could kind of visualize the offend, uh, visualize the the offender, almost kind of conjure a cinematic picture of the right. of the offender. But but that was seventy five years ago. Seventy five years ago, when brain science and neuroscience was nowhere near where it is today. Now we understand what that actually is. He might have called it mysticism. In fact, it's our brain, our subconscious working. And it's something yeah. that, we, that current science has shed a tremendous amount on. If you, if you read the work of Dr. James Fallon, for example, uh, you know, at UC Irvine, uh, you'll see that we have gone, we're light years ahead of where Dr. Brussel was at the time. And I think that because of that, we can understand and put it in context. But to take it out of context and think, you know, have Gladwell think, well, they interviewed 38 people and they're, they're all about mysticism. Um, it's really just a joke. Uh, that is absolutely unfair. It's not accurate. And actually what it does w is it hurts the ability of profilers to actually help law enforcement across the country and around the world. So, again, I'm glad that you wrote Incendiary. I'm glad that you were able to take a more balanced and in-depth look at this because as a, it's a fact that we have solved actually thousands of cases over the years and people's lives have been saved because of it. And that is something that, you know, I'm not just talking about me. Obviously, I'm talking about a whole cadre of profilers in the United States and, and across the pond over there in the UK. Well, I haven't read that particular article, but I have read his other books, and I think an outlier, I mean, he kind of contradicts apparently what he said in this article, because he does talk about, you know, becoming an expert by studying something for thousands and thousands of hours, and, you know, it sounds like well, that's what you're talking yes. about. So another thing, Gladwell's mention of, of there being uh, sort of very broad-based wording in profiles, um, there is a certain amount of that in, in modern day profiles, but that's meant so that the police do not rule out the 1%, the, the outlying cases. And it is the combination of all the different characteristics that, that rule out most people. So in other words, though they may be generalized categories in many cases, they are because there are so many of these categories, it's the combination of all of them together that builds the profile for this particular offender. And yes, some offenders do not fit in very well to every aspect of the profile. In fact, we always say that people, human beings are, are so diverse that it's very difficult to pigeonhole them specifically. But I think Dr. Brussel did it. I know I know there's some celebrated cases that John Douglas did where he did exactly what, what Dr. Brussel did, and he, he described an offender to, to the T, including a hair lip and a, and a three-piece suit all buttoned up and that kind of thing, and, and he was right. And it's because certain offenders and certain cases give us enough behavior to be that specific. But some cases we don't have the investigative detail whether that's because of time, because of lack of resources, or because the offender is so good that they're able to hide and be forensically sophisticated, and they just don't give us that kind of information. In those cases, yeah, we can't help as much, but in the vast majority of cases that we have helped in, it's been a tremendous boon to law enforcement, and actually, it's the reason why we keep getting asked back. It's the reason why we consult on hundreds, if not thousands, of cases every year from the Behavioral Analysis Unit, and I'm sure in London they do the same thing. There was an interesting point he made, which he basically said that you know profiling is written in such a broad language that it can validate almost any conclusion one cares to draw from it. But this case, as well as many others that Jim and I know, this case just shows he was so specific 
I mean, he was so specific in the things that he said. There's no, it wasn't about generalize, you know, generalizability. It was so to the point. I mean, everybody who knew Matetsky, including his relatives, the elderly women he lived with, they, they all said that he was so gentle, he was a gentle man, he wouldn't hurt anybody. But what Dr. Brussels did was really, you know, get into his mind space and be able to talk about, you know, the revenge and the anger that he was feeling on the inside, but how he would appear to the outside world and all the turbulence and conflict on the inside. This, uh, you know, we would call him a revenge stalker in many ways. It was his workplace that he had the angst at and this pattern of disputes, this continuous, you know, howling of making complaints and feeling that he was aggrieved and therefore this was his outlet for justice. But to everybody else, he was the mean, mild-mannered, you know, well-dressed, looked like middle management, although that was very different from what was going on in the inside. And he even got down to the geography of where he would be living, the, the fact that he would be an immigrant, you know, as we talked about what he would be wearing. He talked about the, the linguistic profiling of analysing his penmanship, you know, down to how he formed letters and words. It was so specific. And that's why this case really has, you know, to, to profile is the advent of criminal profiling. It, it was just so accurate in many, many ways with these very few inaccuracies where people could really split hairs. Uh, I think it was heart disease that he said he would have because he ruled out tuberculosis because he felt that antibiotics would have cured that. So it was, again, on sound deductive reasoning as to why he had ruled out tuberculosis, but they were such minor points. So I have to say I, I disagree with Gladwell's, the, the synopsis of what he said with profiling, because the majority of the time it is so specific about the pools um, that, that you fish in, and I do think that you know, you've explained very, very well um, and articulated it in a book, a very gripping book that, you know, people will not want to put down. Um, so I thank you for, for your contribution, because it does read like a thriller, but it is real life. And okay. the research that's gone into it is, is um, you know, commendable. I certainly really enjoyed it. Well, as a footnote to this discussion, I, um, I, I want to set, mention that my publisher sent a copy of this book to, to Malcolm Gladwell, and I, I did wonder if I would hear, hear from him, but so far have not. And it's been getting some great reviews. It's uh, been called Exceptionally Absorbing, a taut thriller, fascinating. And once again, our listeners can get a hold of Michael Cannell's book, Incendiary, by going to Audible, and they can get his audiobook for free with a 30-day trial membership by going to audible.com slash real crime. So, Michael, is there anything else that you uh, found out during the course of the research and writing of this book that you want to share with our listeners? Yeah, I mean, there's one, one other kind of thing we didn't touch on, and it doesn't pertain directly to profiling, but if, if you were to try to pinpoint the moment when newspapers and when print began their long decline, this would be, this would be the moment. It was, it was the... Um, the fact that the newspapers were beginning to lose advertising and circulation to television at this moment in the mid-50s that prompted the uh, Seymour Brooks and the publisher of the General American to begin his secret correspondence with, with the bomber. And, um, and of course... The, the Seymour Brookson's correspondence with the bomber is what kind of work in tandem with Dr. Brussels' profile that to help the 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 police catch catch George George Metesky. So I thought that's just an interesting footnote that this, in a way, um, relates to the history of newspapers and the way in which history uh, newspapers began their low, long their, their long slow decline. At this. At this very moment, it was this manhunt, in a sense, that marked the beginning of the end for for print media. Wow, that, what's interesting about that is it sounds like it also, in the end, marked the beginning of the end for scripted television, because I think it sounds like the first reality television show, right? When when uh, the, the publisher is actually doing secret um, correspondence with an offender like that, uh, eventually that became the basis for a lot of crime TV today. So 
that's an interesting uh, development that that foreshadowed it way back in the mid fifties. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. We could nobody could have seen it then, but we can see it now. Laura, do you have anything else before we sign off? Yeah, I was going to ask you, just um, remind people, how long did it take you to review and research the whole case and to write the book? It took me more than three years. Sounds like a long time, and I guess that is a long time. But what I was trying to do with this book was to write it in a style known as narrative nonfiction. So that's nonfiction. It's all true. It's history. It's journalism. But I was trying to write it in to shape it as a novelist would shape a novel. I was trying to borrow the techniques of fiction and tell this true story as if it were a novel or a Netflix series. And so in order to do that, I really felt like I had to tell the story cinematically. I had to tell it visually. And I, I went to great lengths to really try to understand the people and the scenes in the, in these in in these chapters and to really and to really try to bring them across as if it were a television show and of course that takes that takes a lot of time to do that it takes a lot of microfilm that's great and i think you've done that particularly well because the impact of his crimes i mean it's palpable when you read it you can you've captured the state of terror um, at that time and it really takes you back there and then I, I love the way that you kind of interwoven you know what was going on with the police and then the media and you know of course you know this is real life this is a true story but the way that you've put it together just makes it the page turner that it is so you know congratulations on, on achieving that three years it seems like a long time it does but you've certainly uh, achieved what you set out to, to achieve certainly in my in my eyes so congratulations. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Michael. We should let our listeners know that the Wondery Studios, where we normally record, had a blackout right when we pulled up to record. So we were had to just make a quick plan, and we jumped to a friend's house that lives nearby, and we pulled out our laptops. So, you know, it was it was like on the fly trying to make this happen. So, you know, the sound quality may not be what you're used to in our studio, but it's what we had, and we... You know, we're all in three different time zones. Jim and I are in L.A., Michael's in New York, and Laura's in London. So we had this little brief period of time where we were all, you know, awake. Um, <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for yeah, sticking with it. it through the technical difficulties. And we appreciate it. Yeah, just to say, it's real life, you know, the way that we're rolling right now. And we have had some comments on Twitter, but, you know, we're real profilers doing real cases, talking to real people like Michael and trying to make it work. And that's what happens when you have an international team of people that you have to roll with what you're given. And, you know, we certainly want to make sure that we produce the best um, output and the best podcast for our listeners. But we do have to roll with with what we have so thank you for being patient and thank you michael for being patient with us as well yeah well it's my pleasure i'm flattered to be with you all right well thank you michael i really appreciate you coming on real crime profile and listeners please listen to michael's book incendiary on audible and uh you can get it free with a 30 day subscription on audible.com forward slash real crime Take care, and thank you for listening to Real Crime Profile. So if you enjoy our podcast and would like to support us, there are a couple of important things you can do. First, you can go over to iTunes and give us a positive five-star review. You can check out our sponsors and take advantage of the special promotions for Real Crime Profile listeners. You can go over and like our Facebook page, and you can follow us on Twitter. But most importantly, you can share our podcast with friends, family, and anyone you know would be interested in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. So thank you for listening. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineered by Terrell Parham. Music composed by Simba Zumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go on the website www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Helpline free phone 0800 2000 247. 
In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, safety, shelter or counseling, call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, 214-946-4357 or go on their website, www.genesisshelter.org or the domestic violence hotline on 800-799-7233.